So the million dollar question often asked now is, what do we eat for breakfast? What do we eat for lunch? In this video, we will learn from Barbara O'Neill, a naturopath and health educator dedicated to promoting natural health through proper nutrition. Today, we're going to talk about the importance of choosing the right foods for breakfast and lunch two of the most important meals of the day. Breakfast is often called the most important meal of the day and for good reason. After a night of fasting, your body needs nourishment to kickstart your metabolism, fuel your brain, and provide energy for the day ahead. But not all breakfasts are created equal. Lunch is your opportunity to refuel your body after a busy morning and set the tone for the rest of the day. A balanced lunch can help maintain energy levels and prevent the afternoon slump. Choosing the right foods for breakfast and lunch can make a significant difference in how you feel throughout the day. By focusing on whole, nutrient-dense foods, you can nourish your body, sustain your energy, and support long-term health. Let's make every meal an opportunity to support our well-being. And now, we will hear from Barbara about breakfast recommendations. Let's have a look at some breakfast. Breakfast. My suggestion is always start with fruit. You see, breakfast means break fast. And fruit is a lovely, light, refreshing way for your stomach and your colon to break its fast. If a person has a yeast presence, if a person has diabetes, I would suggest they go for the low GI fruits. If a person is conquering cancer, I would say put fruit on hold initially. And then one may have a grain. It might be millet. It might be quinoa. It might be buckwheat. The Polish love their buckwheat. Aussies are getting used to it. Aussies like buckwheat pancakes. There are a variety of grains and it, it allows the family to start getting used to different grains. And then on that one might have some coconut cream, remember? Excellent oil. Or one might have the pear Brazil nut cream that I mentioned earlier. On top of that one may sprinkle some chia seeds. Sandra Cabot made LSA famous. L S A. And in many shops you can buy linseed or flaxseed, sunflower and almond already ground up in little plastic bags ready for you, but don't touch them. Because you can see from my illustration today, the light, heat and oxygen quickly cause a, de a destruction of the double bonds. So within about an hour of grinding, especially the flaxseed or the linseed and the sunflower, the light, heat and oxygen have been attracted into here and the oils are spoiled. There is a use for your coffee grinder. You can grind your seeds in it just before you eat your breakfast. So let's put in some LSA too. Flaxseed or linseed is a very high oil seed. Three teaspoons of ground linseed will deliver one teaspoon of the oil. So it's a very high oil. Most people are very happy with that breakfast. Fruits that are generally low on the glycemic index include berries like strawberries, raspberries, and blueberries, citrus fruits such as grapefruit, oranges, and lemons, stone fruits like apples, pears, plums, and peaches, and others like cherries, apricots, and pomegranates. Barbara, are there any other options? Or well, some might prefer savory. So this is breakfast number one. Breakfast number two, maybe some fruit, always a nice way to start the day, with some nuts and seeds. And then they might have some sourdough toast. If you're gluten-free, you might go to a millet toast. If you're not gluten-free, you might go to a 
spelt sourdough toast. You see, sourdough is just the way that the, the bread rises. It's a cultured bread. It breaks down the protein or the gluten in the grain, so sourdough bread is more digestible. On top of that, you might have some savoury lentils. Or, on top of that, you might have some scrambled tofu, which is a delicious way to have tofu. Some may prefer that. Barbara will now explain the benefits of each of the recommended breakfasts. What about in the breakfast? I've rubbed off our breakfast, but I can recall our fiber was in our fruit. Actually, the fiber's in everything. The protein in the first breakfast was there was protein in the quinoa, there's protein in the buckwheat, there's protein in the millet, there's protein a little bit in the coconut cream, some in the pear cream, protein in the chia seed and all the linseed, sunflower seed and almonds. In the second breakfast, there was protein in the, in the nuts and there was protein, of course, in your scrambled tofu or your savoury lentils. Whereas the fats in the first breakfast, there was fats in the coconut cream, in the pear cream, in the LSA, in the chia seed. So as you can see by my illustration, it is not, it's not hard to do that because it is the fibre and it is the protein and it is the fat that keeps the food in the stomach longer. What about lunch? So what do we have for lunch? So you see the fine tuning in every case is yours. We should enjoy what we eat. Lunch. Let me think of what we had for lunch today. I'll write you down what we had for lunch today. We had a kale salad. We had avocado, we had a quinoa salad, and the quinoa salad had tomato, onion, and broccoli in it. And then we had a shepherd's pie. And the shepherd's pie had a topping of mashed potato and the nicest way to mash your potato is with olive oil and Celtic salt. Mashed potato. And underneath the mashed potato there was uh, brown lentils in a savoury sauce. In a savoury sauce. If you want to know how to make legumes taste amazing, buy an Indian cookbook, buy a Lebanese or Italian cookbook, they know how to make them taste nice. They know their legumes because for centuries that's what their protein source was. They don't have the land to graze the cattle. We had a couple come here, the Lebanese brother and sister, they were in their early 30s, they said, recently a friend of ours came for tea and we said to our mum, mum, cook some lentils. Our friend is a vegetarian. She said, I'm not going to serve poor man's food. <laughs> you see, growing up in Italy, they saw the lentils as poor man's food. I said, well, now you can go back and tell her it's the rich man's food <laughs> because it is such a superior protein. And there's so many things that you can do with legumes. You just need to find out what to do with them. Now, Barbara will let us know of the benefits of each of the recommended lunch items. Let's make an assessment of the fiber. Everything's got fiber. The protein, there's a little bit of protein in your quinoa or your quinoa. There's protein in your lentils. And I think that the lentils were made savory with miso. Miso puts a lovely flavor in lentils. Am I right? Oh, I just got a shake. There was no miso in it today. Sometimes there's miso in it. So there's our protein and fats. There was coconut cream in this. Yes, I got a nod there. Olive oil in the mashed potato and also some olive oil in the brown noodles. I, I got nods for all of that. And I think there was a bit of olive oil with the kale. Oh, another nod. 
<laughs> and avocado. So you see this meal was an excellent source of fiber, protein and healthy fats and yet very low in carbohydrates. Where are the carbohydrates? Uh, some carbohydrates in the potato, small amount of carbohydrates in the brown lentils. I had lunch, oh we're looking at, I finished lunch two hours ago now and I'm comfortably satisfied two and a half hours ago. I have no no want at all to eat now and you will find when you feed children meals that are high in fiber good amounts of protein and healthy fats that there's just no desire or need to eat all day long as a mother i was not interested in being in the kitchen all day so i made sure that i made that my children had meals that were high in fiber some good proteins and healthy fats and now for Barbara's final thoughts. I trust that after this illustration, you will no more be swayed by popular opinion on fats. I trust that I have shown you enough evidence that the fats are important, the type of fat is important, important to eat them in their natural state with a little bit of added either olive oil or coconut both excellent oils and basically it is your palate that de defines that we don't need very much in fact in the shepherd's pie that was made today we had two four six seven people for lunch today and i would endeavor to say that about a tablespoon of olive oil went into that dish would that be right <laughs> about that do you know what that means everyone got about half a teaspoon of olive oil see that's not a lot and maybe everyone got a quarter of a teaspoon of coconut cream you don't need very much it gives it a beautiful flavor it gives a beautiful richness and how often have people's tables been deficient in flavor and taste because they think that the fats are bad when I cook with olive oil, I put my olive oil in at the end of my meal so that I'm not destroying my double bond. If you did want to fry a little bit, sometimes uh, our cook likes to fry a little bit to get the flavour out of the onion or the garlic, then the no double bonds coconut oil is the one to use. I know Zach does our potatoes in coconut oil and it is delicious it is crunchy and yet he does it in the oven he lightly coats the potatoes puts them in a high oven and they're just like chips some people think we've deep fried them but all we've done is put them in a high oven delicious and yet you are not destroying because there are no double bonds and the flavor most people don't even know that it's cooked in coconut oil because you can't even taste it. You certainly can overdo it. So, of course, we need to recognize that they're very concentrated foods and you don't need very much. So I trust you're excited with the prospect of beginning to implement some of these things into your lifestyle, into your table, into your food. Please enjoy. Remember... Your health is the lock, and we're here to provide the keys. Keep turning to Key Health for insights that unlock your full potential. The key to lifelong vitality is in your hands, it's just one bite away.